Lord, we thank you that you have brought us each safely here today. In a sense, God, it really should amaze us that you give us another day of life because we are undeserving, Lord, of another day of life. Yet in your mercy, that's what you do, not just for us, but even for most of those who are not yours. You are an exceptionally merciful God. And we recognize that mercy and pray that it would be new to us today, God. As Lamentations 3 says, through your word, through the prophet Amos. Uh, Lord, we do want to ask your blessing on our brother Mark Rodolfi. We're so thankful for him and his leadership of this class. Father, we ask that you would make him well and that you would raise him up in the fullness of health. You also put, Lord, on my own heart coming dark driving down this morning tom sawyer i pray that lord you would restore his strength as well we know that isaiah 40 31 they will rise up with wings as eagles is primarily meant to be spiritual but i pray physically god that you would cause this brother to rise up with wings as eagles um jim was good a minute ago to remind us to pray for Sosha, Shosha, Lord, we ask that you would sustain her and that you would heal her and that you would keep her cancer, Lord. Uh, just we pray that you would restrain its force in her body and that your grace would minister very deeply, Lord, to her soul. And of course, there are many others in this room and outside this room who need, God, a touch of your grace today. We pray that you would touch us with that same grace, again, through your word, God, which you inspired in the mouth of the prophet Amos so many centuries ago. May it be fresh to us today, and may it be a cause, God, for us to exult in you, that is, to rejoice that you are the God that you are. So we pray for your grace now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, everyone. Turn to the book of Amos. If Paul Amos were here, he's away on a business trip, we would say turn to Paul's book, right? All right, the book of Amos. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, <laughs> Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. How about that? So this is what we're going to do. Our passage for today is chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 2, verse 3. And what the passage is, this passage has a name because it's very similar to... Um, five other passages in the Old Testament. Uh, these are called judgment oracles against the nations. That is, they are pronouncements of God's judgment by the prophet. Yeah, thank you, Chasdeep. I don't know why that doesn't want to, and this doesn't want to do either, does it? We'll just balance it, <laughs> not touch it and see if it stays. So these are pronouncements of God's judgment against the peoples around uh, the Jewish nation. Now God's going to come to the Jewish nation, so uh, they're going to have their word too, but we're going to look first at the oracles of judgment against the nations. And let me give you the, if you look at page two, if you've got your handout, you'll see these exact same sort of oracles appear at Isaiah 13 to 23, Jeremiah 46 to 51, Ezekiel 25 to 32, the book of Obadiah, which is only one chapter, is a judgment oracle against Edom, and the book of Nahum, which is three chapters, is an oracle of judgment against Nineveh. Now, if my math is correct, and higher math is generally beyond me, that's 27 and a half chapters of the Old Testament. 
is taken up with these oracles of judgment. So I thought, goodness gracious, that's a lot of the Bible. 27 and a half chapters. These must be pretty important. And so I want to reflect with you this morning. We will read them, and Lord willing, we'll have time to walk back through them. But mainly, I want to ask, you know, why are these here? Why are these judgments not just here in Amos, but in Isaiah? And 10, 11 chapters of Isaiah are taken up with these oracles of judgment. So this is a significant theme in the Bible. Consequently, I reasoned, it behooves us to try to understand, God, why did you inspire so much of these, so many of these oracles of judgment in the Bible? Okay, now let's do a little introduction to the book of Amos first. Then we're going to read uh, the passage, and then we're going to come back and ask that sort of big general question about these oracles of judgment. So here's the introduction to Amos. The, uh, the introduction you need is chapter 1, verse 1, and then we're going to go to chapter 7, verses 14 to 15. These are the only times that Amon mentions himself in this book. So chapter 1, verse 1, hear the word of the Lord. The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And then if you'll turn to chapter 7, Verses 14 to 15, the only other time he mentions himself is in these two verses. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Okay, so put these two passages together. Amos chapter 1, verse 1 was from Tekoa. This is the Tekoa in Israel and not the Tekoa in North Georgia, where the little Bible college is, if you know that, which is spelled differently anyway. Um, Tekoa is, was located about 10 miles south of Jerusalem. Now, Amos was a prophet during the time of the divided kingdom, meaning the northern kingdom was Israel and the southern kingdom was Judah, both Jewish, but very different in character. If you've read the books of First and Second Kings, you know that to be the case, okay? So northern kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom of Judah. He was from the southern kingdom, but mainly, not exclusively, but mainly he prophesied against the northern kingdom. Okay, now, a lot of the uh, commentators on the book of Amos point out that, that Amos had three different professions, right? So here, chapter 1, he's a shepherd. Chapter 7, he mentions he's a herdsman, that is, he raises livestock, and a dresser of sycamore fig trees. So a caretaker of sycamore fig trees. Sycamore fig trees do not grow in Tekoa. It's below sea level, and sycamore fig trees need uh, to be above sea level in order to grow. So it may be, it may be that Amos relocated for work purposes. Some of you know what that's like. But he relocated for work purposes to the northern kingdom. We don't know. But he was from the southern kingdom, but mainly, again, not exclusively, but mainly preached against the northern kingdom. When we read here, during the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and Jeroboam, this is the second Jeroboam, the son of Joash. That means the first half of the 700s BC. So roughly somewhere between 790 in 750 BC. This was a time of prosperity and peace for both of those kingdoms. If you remember when we studied Hosea, Hosea was active as a prophet in the northern kingdom about the same time as Amos. So the circumstances are very similar. And you'll see at the end, he mentions 
two years before the earthquake, that same earthquake is mentioned in Zechariah 14.5. So it must have been quite an earthquake, quite something memorable uh, for the people of the Jewish kingdoms, but we don't know the date of that particular earthquake. But we're somewhere in the first half of the 700s BC, okay? So I think that's uh, all the introduction that I intended to give. Let's read chapter 1, verse 2, down through chapter 2, verse 3. And you'll see that Amos prophesies against seven people groups. When we say oracles against the nations, we don't understand nations like formal nation states like Switzerland or Chad or Peru or the United States. Okay, these are people groups. Think people groups. These are ethnic people groups. Now, they do live in a certain area. And they have kings and leaders, okay? But it's it's more informal than a formal nation state is today. And he pronounces judgment against seven of them. And that's interesting, of course, because in Hebrew, the number seven stands for completeness. So we may uh, be supposed to understand that this is God's word against all the nations who are opposed to him. And these are just representative peoples. Most of the names you'll recognize from the Old Testament as historic, constant enemies of the people, of the Jewish people, of the people of Israel. Okay, so with that introduction, let's read chapter 2, verse 2, through chapter 2, verse 3. And you'll see each of these seven oracles against these different people groups, they follow the same short format. Okay. All right, hear the word of the Lord. And he said, Amos, the Lord through Amos, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn and the top of Carmel withers. Okay, so this is, that's the introduction. The Lord, who's, who certainly is omnipresent, he's present in all points of space, but in the Old Testament age, his presence dwelt in a special way in Jerusalem, in the temple above the Ark of the Covenant. And so God speaks of his judgment going out to these nations from Jerusalem. So let's begin the judgments formal. Verse 3. For three transgressions of Damascus. Damascus was and is today the capital of Syria. For three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they have threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. So I will send a fire upon the house of Hazael, and it shall devour the strongholds of ben Haddad. I will break the gate bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitants from the valley of Aven, and him who holds the scepter from Beit Aden. And the people of Syria shall go into exile to Kir, says the Lord, Number two, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four. Now, Gaza, because of current history, we think of the Palestinian territory lying along the Mediterranean Sea in the southern southwestern part of the Holy Land. Gaza was one of the five cities of the Philistines. Amos will mention four of them. The one he leaves out is Gath, where Goliath was from. Okay, so he's this is a prophecy against the Philistines. Interestingly enough, that they aren't ethnically related, the name Palestine and Palestinian is derived from the word Philistine because the Philistines lived in that particular area, among other reasons. For three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. Because they carried into exile whole people to deliver them up to Edom. So I will send a fire upon the wall of Gaza, and it shall devour her strongholds. I will cut off the inhabitants from Ashdod, and him who holds the scepter from Ashkelon. I will turn my hand against Ekron, and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, says the Lord God. Number three, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyre, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. 
because they delivered up a whole people to Edom and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. So I will send a fire upon the wall of Tyre, and it shall devour her strongholds. Number four, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because he pursued his brother with the sword and cast off all pity, and his anger tore perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. So I will send a fire upon Teman, and it shall devour the strongholds of Bozrah. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the Ammonites, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they have ripped open pregnant women in Gilead, that they might enlarge their border. So I will kindle a fire in the wall of Rabbah, and it shall devour her strongholds, with shouting on the day of battle, with the tempest in the day of the whirlwind. And their king shall go into exile, he and his princes together, says the Lord. Finally, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because he burned to lime the bones of the kings of Edom. So I will send a fire upon Moab, and it shall devour the strongholds of Kerioth. And Moab shall die amid uproar, amid shouting and the sound of the trumpet. I will cut off the ruler from its midst and will kill all its princes with him. Okay, now I'm counting, and I'm counting one, two, three, four, five, six. That <laughs> judgment. So when I counted seven earlier, I miscounted. So there are six of these, not seven. I apologize for that mistake. But let's step back, 27 and a half chapters of the Old Testament are devoted to these oracles against the nations. That's so much of the Bible. It made me ask myself, okay, why are these there? I'm not sure I'd ever really thought through the question before until yesterday as I was preparing this lesson. I thought, oh, goodness, that's a lot of the Bible. We need to try, if, if God saw fit, to put that many judgment oracles against the nations in the Bible, it, it seems that we should try to understand why he did that. There, there's a good reason. There's a good reason. So I, um, and, and you, know, you add your thoughts as well as we go along, but I have um, four thoughts, okay? So four reasons I think that the Lord and of course there are a million reasons but four reasons why so much of the Old Testament is made up of these oracles of judgment against the nations okay number one the Bible is making the point that the God of the Bible is the God of all the nations of the earth all the people groups of the earth not just of Israel and Judah, not just of the Jewish people. God is God of all peoples. Now, why do I make that point? Because it appears that in the Old Testament world, with the exception of Israel, the people groups conceived of their gods as being territorial gods. What do I mean by that? It means that their God's power extended to the borders of their territory. Let me give you one biblical example of this. In 1 Kings 20, the Lord appears to the king of Israel and says, I want you to go and I want you to defeat the Syrians because the Syrians have gravely dishonored me. How did the Syrians gravely dishonor the Lord? They had lost a battle the previous year against Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, in the mountains. And they said, well, the reason we lost is because Yahweh is a God of the mountains. If we fight them in the valley, Yahweh has no power in the valley and will beat them. Do you see? So they thought Yahweh's power was confined to the mountains. 
And the Lord said to the king of Israel, that thought is so dishonoring to me. I want you to you, I want you to be the tool of my judgment against Syria for so besmirching my glory and calling me a mere territorial God like all the other territorial gods of the earth. Okay? God is the God of all the people groups. Okay? That's number one. Now, number two follows, right? So I know we haven't said everything. Number two, the Lord claims sovereignty over all the peoples of the earth because he created all things, including all the peoples of the earth. And the creator gets to be the ruler of the things that he creates. Psalm 24, verses 1 through 2. Follow David's logic in this psalm. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Now, the fullness of the earth includes what? Everything. Okay? Everything. Uh, you know, that pen in front of Kevin, is that part of the fullness of the earth? Yes. Is God sovereign over Kevin's pen? Yes. Is God sovereign over Kevin's glass of water? Yes. Is God sovereign over Kevin? <laughs> Most yes. importantly, he absolutely is. Yes. Okay? So, um, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. Now, notice the next word, four. Okay? These... These little uh, coordinate conjunctions in the Bible are so important. Four. The four there means what? It's a Bible study point. It means what? Because. Okay, so it's telling you that verse two is giving you the reason for verse one. So why does God own everything in the earth, including all the people groups of the earth, because he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers, which means what? Yeah, he cre in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Therefore, the heavens and the earth belong to God. They are his to dispose of as he sees fit. Listen to Deuteronomy 10, 14. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth with all that is in it. Okay, so God owns the farthest reaches of space. God owns it all. It's occurred to me recently because you know, NVIDIA's stock valuation has uh, reached more than two trillion dollars in just in like two years after. I'm crazy, crazy. Why didn't I get it? Because I don't have any money. That's why. I <laughs> but you know, I think about artificial intelligence. And I have students who are just wow. But I have one especially who just I've got to be in the art and artificial intelligence industry. And artificial intelligence, apparently in surgery, their surgeons are able to do great things. And I'm thankful to God for that common grace of artificial intelligence. I just don't think God's very impressed with artificial intelligence. Compare it, but you can search. So can artificial intelligence tell us what one single human being is thinking? Not yet. <laughs> Does artificial intelligence know anything about what's happening on a star a million light years away from Earth? Absolutely nothing. <clears throat> now think of it, just ponder this. Ponder this. Okay. Um, how many um, molecules are there in your fingernail, on your pointer finger? Maybe a million? <laughs> Mm, we'll say a million. Okay, just nice round number. There are a million. I mean, imagine how many you cut off when you clip your nails. <laughs> say a million molecules. Um, 
who is sovereignly moving and operating all those million molecules? God is. Okay. Every time a molecule moves, there are probably a billion consequences of the movement of that molecule. And God knows every one of those consequences. And there are how many molecules in the universe was uncountable? It's un the number is unfathomable. And God knows all the movements of all the molecules and all the consequences. He knows if the molecule moved to the right rather than the left, what would happen? I mean, God's knowledge is so many times that of artificial intelligence. The number is unimaginably great. Paul says how, how deep are the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. And I heard somebody say this week, and God never gets a headache. <laughs> Thinking of everything that he thinks, every instant. God is unfathomably large. He is the, the heaven of heavens belong to him. Abraham Kuyper, who was a Dutch Bible teacher and one of the founders of the Free University of Amsterdam, uh, was inaugurated as its president in 1880. Ultimately, he would become the prime minister of the Netherlands. Uh, but at his inauguration as president of the university, he has one very famous quote, and it's as follows, translated from Dutch. I don't know any Dutch. Quote, there is not a square inch of the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. God is sovereign over all the nations. Why does God have so the Philistines, their God was Dagon. Did they ever claim that Dagon could hold the Israelites responsible for not obeying his will? No, because Dagon's territory only goes so far as the Philistine territory. I mean, this is so to the to the peoples around Israel, this is pretty outrageous. You mean your God claims to be able to punish us for breaking his law? And the Israelite says, it's exactly what we claim. Okay, number three, both the Old Testament and the New Testament record occasions when prophets and apostles use this reality, the sovereignty of God over all people groups, to challenge pagan peoples to worship the one true God of the Bible, who is infinitely greater than their puny deities. I'm thinking of Jonah in the midst of the storm when the sailors, who are pagans, cast lots, the lot falls to Jonah. They believe Jonah's responsible for the storm. They reason he's angered his God. And so they asked Jonah, Jonah, from what people do you come and who is your God? And Jonah answers, I am an Israelite. I worship Yahweh. And then he adds what? The what? The creator of heaven and earth. The creator of heaven and earth. And what's the response of the sailors? It's really curious. They become afraid. Why? That's not what they claim for their gods. Jonah's saying that his God is a lot bigger than their gods. And so they, Jonah says, just throw me overboard and the storm will stop. And they we're not, we don't want to make your God mad by throwing you overboard, Jonah. Your God's a lot bigger than ours. 
But then Jonah talks them into it. They do, the storm stops, and what do they do? They offer sacrifices to the Lord on the boat, presumably at risk of burning the boat up in the process. And then they go to Israel and offer more sacrifices. Now, maybe they were converted. We don't know. We don't know. Okay. Now, fast forward to the New Testament. The Apostle Paul is in Athens at the Areopagus, Mars Hill, where all the philosophers gathered, were told to exchange the latest ideas. Sounds sort of like Starbucks, right? <laughs> So, you know, what does Paul do? It's so brilliant. He says, I've seen that you Athenian philosophers, you're very religious people. And I've seen statues to all kinds of gods. But he said, I've seen one statue to what? The unknown God. Okay, so you've got that one just so you're... You know, we better not, it, just in case we miss somebody, we don't want to offend him or her. So we're going to erect this one to the unknown God. And Paul says, let me tell you about the God you don't know. He's the creator of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in temples made by human hands. He doesn't live in the Parthenon. And you cannot confine him to a building. He's unconfinable. He doesn't need anything outside of himself. You can't give him anything that he needs because God does not need anything. To the contrary, Paul says. It's not just the case that God doesn't need anything from you, but anything that you have that's good, including your next breath, comes from him. He's the supplier of everything. And we read that some of them were converted to faith in Jesus Christ, including Dionysius the Areopagite. I was just reading that in my devotions the other day, and I thought, you know what? When I get to heaven, I'm going to look for Dionysius the Areopagite. That's going to be that's going to be one person going to look for first thing. Hey, where's Dionysius the Areopagite? Just curious to meet him. Okay, so how would we use that today? One of the things I've thought about recently was, is how much bigger, let me be careful because I don't want to be um, disrespectful, but I do want to be truthful. How much bigger the God of the Bible is than the God of Islam? Have you ever noticed that? The God of, I mean, yet they're both creators of all things. But there's one really huge thing that the God of the Bible does that Allah doesn't do. And what is that? Okay, love is one thing. Okay, well, they would say Allah created the whole earth. Do what? Died for us. Died for us. God saves. The God of the Bible saves sinners. Who saves sinners in Islam? To the extent there, that, I mean, there, Islam has a very underdeveloped theology of sin. But who saves sinners in Islam? No. Sinners do. <clears throat> The God of the Bible is immensely greater than the God of Islam. Yeah, we sing, remember that old course, our God saves, our God saves. Our God saves. Salvation belongs to the Lord. It doesn't belong to Allah. Nobody claims it does. Salvation belongs to the Lord. So just as in the Old Testament and in Athens, God was so much bigger than the gods of all the other peoples. The God of the Bible is so much bigger and greater and better than the gods of all the peoples today as well. Okay, now, number four, the major point, the oracles against the nations also mean that this sovereign God is the lawgiver whom the nations must obey. So here's a question. 
when God in these oracles against the nations says, I'm going to judge you, Ammon or Philistia or in other Babylon or Tyre or Egypt or whoever it is, I'm going to judge you. On what basis does God judge them? Or to put a sharper point on the question, for what law does God hold them accountable? He, he does not hold them accountable for violating the Old Testament. Do you ever see God say, Babylonians, I am going to judge you for that big pork barbecue roast the other day. That's not kosher. Or does he ever say, Edom, you failed to observe the Passover last year. So I'm going to judge you. Not he. That's not the basis for his judgment. What's the basis for God's judgment of the nations? And so all people are going to give an account to God at the last judgment. What will be the basis of God's judgment? Rosetta? It sins against God. Okay, it sins against God. Okay, the moral law that Paul says what? Romans 2, 15 to 16 is... Anosha. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. That's the next point. Excellent. Okay. It's the law, Paul says, that's written on every human heart. Okay. There is a law, a moral law, that God has written on every human heart. Now, this is where I really started. And so, I really thank you for the privilege of being able to teach this class because you forced me to think about things. And I started to think about things. I said, okay, Paul writes in Romans 2, 15 to 16, he mentions the more, there's a moral law written on every human heart. If I come up to you without any provocation whatsoever and slug you in the head, virtually everybody in the world is going to say that was wrong. And I'm not and I'm not going to answer, says who? Because we all know it. Why? Because God's moral law is written on our hearts. But what's the this is the question I had never asked myself until yesterday. What's the content of God's moral law written on our hearts? Okay, it's love, good, Rosetta. Put that together with what Anosha said. Holiness, righteousness. Okay, I want to suggest it's two things. I'm going to make this suggestion. You study this yourself and see if you think I'm right. Okay, I think I'm right, but I think I'm right. <laughs> I think the moral law that God's written on every human heart is the two great commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and strength. Why do I think that? Because if you have you ever noticed that Romans 2 comes after Romans 1? <laughs> in your Bible, what does Paul talk about in Romans 1? In the same context, Paul says, We all know that God's there. And the sin that's underneath every other sin in the universe. The sin that is underneath every other sin in the universe is our refusal to give that God the worship that he is owed. Okay? Worship in the biggest sense. I don't mean just singing to him, though that's part of it. But worship is offer your bodies a living sacrifice to God because this is your acceptable act of worship. So what we owe God is everything we are and everything we have. But Paul says the great human tragedy is we suppress the truth. We suppress the truth of who God is and our duty to owe him worship because ever since the Garden of Eden, we have wanted to be our own gods and call our own shots. We want to worship the image in the mirror every morning. 
So I, I want to suggest you, in the context of Romans, when Paul says God has written his moral law on our hearts, the moral law is first, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. Okay. We owe God the duty of worship. We know it. Everybody knows it. The most convinced atheist in the world knows it, which is precisely why he's the most convinced atheist in the world. I love the, the atheist Thomas Nagel who teaches at New York University. In a, an article, in a book one time, confessed, he said, I think probably I have quote, a cosmic authority problem. Well, that's honest, because you do have a cosmic authority problem. Okay, your problem is that God is God, and you don't like it, because you want to be God. And so we worship, Paul says, how does that mean? We worship everything but God. We worship the created order, and people are out there worshiping money and NVIDIA stock and relationships and the praise of other people whales. and whales and you name it, we worship it. So I think the first part of the law written on our hearts is love the Lord your God. And then I think the second part is love your neighbor as yourself. So it is, as Rosetta said, it's love because what does, it, it struck me, what does God hold the nations accountable for in this passage? In Amos 2, 2, or 1, 2 to Amos 2, 3. Mainly for their abuse of the Jewish people, but in the case of Mo the Moabites, is their abuse of the Edomites. Okay, it's their failure to love their neighbor as themselves. So I think if you have to summarize the moral law that God has written on our hearts, it's you owe God worship. What's worship? Everything that you are, everything that you have. Giving him first place in your heart. Loving him with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Okay. The second is loving your neighbor as yourself. If I steal from you, And you say, well, that's wrong for you to steal from a notion. Am I going to say, says who? Well, I'm in the state of Illinois, but there's a much more important lawgiver than the state of Illinois, infinitely more important than the state of Illinois. And that's God who says, thou shalt not steal. Right, so... When, when God, I mean, this is, so these oracles against the nations, don't pass these up lightly. Understand, this is a claim that nobody else in the ancient world made for their gods. Israel is saying, our God owns everything. Our God owns everybody. And everybody in the universe owes God worship. Everybody's God is Yahweh, whether they acknowledge it or not. He, because he's the only God that there is. He created you. You owe him your worship. And he commands you to love one another. And you haven't done it. And God is going to hold you accountable. I mean, that would, that's a stunning claim in the world in which the Israelites live. I mean, to the Babylonians, there would have been no categories to think of a God who made such comprehensive and audacious claims as that, to be the creator of all things, the sovereign of all things. Okay? Well, let's look real quickly. We've got five minutes. Let's look at the actual passage. That's just the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> so, I used to speak at this um, theology conference every year, and I had a plan. You got to speak, you got to present a paper, and uh, the, they said you have 35 minutes to present your paper, and then you have to take questions for 15 minutes. Well, the audience was a bunch of seminary professors, and I, you know, 
So what I, you know what I did? I wrote a paper that would take 50 minutes every, look at the time. <laughs> no time for questions. So sorry, everybody. And then I'd scoot out of the room before anybody could ask a question that I knew would stop me. So that's what I do every week. I, I do, you know. 45 minutes of introduction, five minutes of teaching, so you can't have time for any good questions. <laughs> no, no. Let's look real quickly, okay? So Damascus first, that's Syria. For three transgressions of Damascus and for four, not to go, for each of these, it's, it's very, you know, they're similar, right? Very similar. So three or four means that the sin is full. Remember God said to Abraham in Genesis 15, he said, your descendants are going to go and live in captivity in another land for more than 400 years, but I will bring them back when the sin of the, he, he called the Canaanite peoples, the Amorites, is full. Okay, their sin is full. There's a, there's a point in God's patience. Don't ask me how this works. It's his mind, not mine. There's a point in God's patience where God says, all right, that's it. Your sin has reached a level that it's judgment time in this world, in this world. But what have they done? They have threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of, of iron. Gilead is the part of Israel that was located on the east bank of the Jordan River. Reuben, tribe of Reuben, tribe of Gad, and half of the tribe of Manasseh. That's Gilead. When Jeremiah asks, is there not a balm in Gilead? He's referring to the territory of Israel on the east bank, which is where Syria is. And he says, you thresh my people like a threshing sledge that divides wheat from the chaff. Okay, So last week we saw in Joel chapter 3, that um, God was angry at the nations who had abused his people. And here it is again. Okay, God takes the abuse of his people very seriously. Let me make one observation that I didn't make clearly enough last week. So who are the, who are the people who get abused whom God takes that abuse very seriously? Well, clearly... In the New Testament age, it's believers. Okay? God takes the persecution of believers very seriously. Jesus said to Saul, 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 why do you persecute me? Okay, Jesus took very seriously Saul's persecution of the church. He counted it as persecution against him. Matthew 25, okay? Inasmuch as you did not do it to the least of these, my brothers, you did not do it to me. Okay, um, but I also think this is personal. You can reject the following or you can accept it. Just think about it yourself. Um, I also think because I believe Romans 11, God has future plans for the Jewish people. I think that um, his objection, his abuse of his people includes Jewish people at this time in history. Okay, that's my personal opinion from my reading of scripture. So in other words, um, Germany paid a price for its abuse of the Jewish people and Arab nations or Persian nations like Iraq that abused the people of Israel, I think will pay a price in God's judgment for that abuse. Okay? That's my own sense. Again, you may accept that or reject that, but that's my sense. Okay. All right, so the Lord says, I will send a fire, and he says that in each of the judgment oracles, I'm going to send fire. This is, God sends fire in two ways, right? There's good fire, which is the fire of the fire of the Holy Spirit who purifies, okay, who, who burns sin away, and then there's the fire of judgment that just burns up. Our speaker today is going to speak on um, Exodus 3, the burning bush. Why did the bush burn but didn't burn up? What was God saying? 
He's saying, this is what I want to be inside of you, Moses, and inside of all my people. I want to be a fire inside of you, but not one that burns you up, not one that consumes. This is purification and not judgment. Okay, But this is judgment here. I will send a fire upon the house of Hazael, one of the kings of Syria. You can look at 2 Kings 13. And it shall devour the strongholds of Ben-Hadad, 2 Kings 10, another king of the Syrians. I will break the gate bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitants from the valley of Avan. And him who holds the scepter from Beit Eden and the people of Syria shall go into exile to Kir, says the Lord. Okay, so the prophecy of judgment. Second, against the Philistines. For three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. Okay, so this is certain. And the, where are the Philistines today? They disappeared into the sands of history. Why? God judged them. Because they carried into exile a whole people to deliver them up to Eden. Okay, so they took Israelites and delivered them up to the Edomites. So I'll send a fire upon the wall of Gaza, and it shall devour her strongholds. And then he mentions the other, three of the other cities of the Philistines, Ashdod and Ashkelon and Ekron. Tyre, verse 9, for three transgressions of Tyre. If you know, Tyre and Babylon, both Old Testament and New Testament, become symbolic of the whole world system in rebellion against God. Because they delivered up the whole people to Edom, same thing as the Philistines did, and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. That's probably a reference to a treaty between uh, Israel and Tyre, like the one that King Solomon made with King Hiram of Tyre during the time of Solomon. Or maybe it is that treaty. Verse 11. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom. Now, why is Edom's abuse of the Jewish people especially serious? Okay, so they're relatives, right? The, the Philistines aren't related to the Israelites. The Edomites are. They're descendants of Esau, okay, the brother of Jacob. So as a consequence, their abuse of Israel, which began at the time of the Exodus, okay, you can refer to Exodus uh, or anyway, I've got the reference to the passage in the, uh, in the notes, but the Lord says, um, for three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because he pursued his brother. I said, this is a relative thing with the sword and cast off all pity. And his anger toward perpetually. I mean, it, Edom is the, except for a short period, the historic foe of Israel. I mean, is, Edom is always an enemy against the Jewish people. So I will send a fire upon Taman, one of the cities of Edom, and it shall devour the strongholds of Bozra, uh, another city. Then verse 13, the Ammonites, what's wrong with them? They're also related to the Israelites, right? Through Lot. Okay, you can go to Genesis 19 and read the story, but it's so ugly, don't. <laughs> I mean, you remember the Ammonites and the Moabites. Mm, how did they come about? Yeah. Yes, yes, okay. But for three, for the transgressions of the Ammonites, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. Let me look what they have, because they have ripped open pregnant women in Gilead. Okay, and as soon as we... No, is there ripping open of the wounds of pregnant women in the United States today? Okay. Why? That they may enlarge their border. So I will kindle a fire in the wall of Rabba, and it shall devour her strongholds with shouting on the day of battle, with the tempest in the day of the whirlwind. And their king shall go into exile, he and his princes together, says the Lord. And then finally, Moab, the only point I want to make here is the others are being judged for their abuse of the Israelites. 
But God holds nations accountable for their abuse of nations even other than Israel, too. So, for example, to the extent that the Russians abuse the Ukrainians, God will hold them accountable for it, and vice versa. For three transgressions of Moab and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because he burned to lime the bone of the king of Edom. That was a, a sacrilege to the body of a deceased king. So I will descend fire upon Moab, and it shall devour the strongholds of Kerioth. Um, Kerioth may be where Judas was from. Judas Iscariot, Judas, Judas of Kerioth. And Moab shall die amid uproar, amid shouting, and the sound of tr the trumpet. I will cut off the ruler from its midst, and will kill all its princes with him, says the Lord. Okay. Did these judgments come to pass? Answer, yes. Seen any Moabites? Ammonites? As uh, Pastor Ed used to say, mosquito bites? <laughs> and, but one last thought. Did God rescue anybody from Moab? <laughs> he rescued Ruth, who was the great-grandmother, grandmother of David. No, great-grandmother of David. And David was the ancestor of Jesus. So depending on the genealogies and how they work, who is Mary's and which one is Mary's and which one is Joseph's, it seems Jesus had a little drop of Moabite blood in him through his ancestor Ruth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely trickles down to me. I'm the most Gentile Gentile in the world. All right, let's pray. I hope, um, you know, just so what's the, you know, Pastor Phillips says he gives a takeaway. So what's the takeaway? The God of the Bible is a lot bigger than, and a lot better than any of the other substitutes in the world. Okay. There is no God. There is no God like the God of the Bible, even close, even close. He is exceedingly greater and exceedingly better than any other of his competitors. Let's pray. I think the music's starting. Father, um, give us the grace now to worship you. And I think especially, Lord, we're about to observe the Lord's Supper. And we're to examine ourselves. God, would you give us a spirit of um, honesty as your Holy Spirit searches our hearts. Would you give us a oh, spirit yeah. of confession and repentance. Oh, no, no, no. In Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> All right.